we use one verse, we do have many verses, but we use one to get it started. Romans 8.30. teaching quite a bit the last couple of years on the topic of salvation and salvation is composed of basically these three different dynamics justification sanctification and glorification as I look through the channels or you can even look through the um, YouTube channel I talk a lot about these justification and sanctification but you know something we leave out we don't talk about as much is glorification when I looked at the scriptures I found out that glorification is something that you definitely don't want to put at any lesser of uh, uh, importance than being justified, being made right before God, being sanctified. What is sanctified? Set aside. Set aside. Amen. So we understand these. Anybody call it anything else? Sanctification. Set aside for service. Set apart for service. If I was teaching sanctification, if I was going to teach correctly, what would I have to definitely point out about it? After, if you're going to teach sanctification, you better definitely let people, and this is the problem with Christendom today, they don't understand this. What, 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 what would I have to highlight about sanctification? Spiritually set aside. Spiritually set aside. That's definitely, the definitely two, spiritual. There's two this aspects is, to it, positional and experiential. Amen. Amen. You have to let them know there's two aspects to it. And we say this a lot of different ways. We say this a lot of different ways here. We say, yeah, we say positional and practical is what I, but I think that's, that's the same thing. I heard somebody say um, position is going to be our state. It's just how it's taught. And then this would be your what? Standing. Your performance. Your performance is another thing they use. Some people say standing with this, though. Well, no, standing would be here, actually. Scriptures use the word should. In Romans, Ephesians, and Titus, we sh should, but not all of us will. Amen. So I was just really pointing this out. Okay, you can't write on the board when she used this problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably got a little bit of it on that marker there. But the reason I wanted to go through that. Because you want to just know, this is what we've talked about. And so all these things that, all these different ways you may have heard different teachers talk about it, definitely what we've already gone through. So what I want to talk about today is something that we don't talk about quite that much. You know where I hear a lot of this being made reference to at? An event that happens in everybody's life unless Christ comes back first? What is it? That's the rapture that, unless that Christ come back over to first, at first, but I hear this preached a lot of places. Funerals? Yeah, funerals. <laughs> We're not going to wait for a funeral because this is not, sometimes people don't really understand, but this is good news. It's a part of the good news, and in fact, it is a part of our hope. It is our hope. And our hope is that thing that should motivate us to want to get to or to be inspired to get to what our hope is. And this is what it actually is making reference to. I love this verse here because it's so, it has the assurance. It's letting you know that these things are going to manifest themselves. Look what it says. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also did what? 
glorified. This is coming. This is manifesting itself in your life already, but the fullness of it is coming. The day that God gives you a new body, this is coming. So you might as well get ready for it. You want to be, a, you want to be equipped in a manner that when you get there, you've done everything that you can to be the best that you can possibly be on the day of Christ and the day of your glorification. And if we stop teaching or don't inform you about the, the dynamics or the things you need to do to make that make sure when this event happens in your life, you're the best, your most that you can possibly be, we fall short. Now, the things that we talk about in the inner workings of justification, or actually sanctification, are definitely equipping you for it, but we want to kind of like put the carrot in front of you to a certain extent right now. We want to kind of give you some glimpses of what God really has in store for us to keep us motivating that this, we have a different hope than this world. You're, you're, you're different. You, there's something special about you. God has something unique and divine about you. So many people are so uh, unclear about what their future holds as it pertains to their spiritual life. We shouldn't be unclear about it. We should be able to share this message with any and everybody that, we, that comes across our path. So we begin to talk about our hope. Go up to, a little further in this same passage of scripture here. Um, uh, Minister Rondell actually spoke on it earlier. Look at Romans 8.24. Romans 8, 24. I'll start there. It says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what? And now, we're just really trying to see that this hope that we see, we don't see a hope. This, we're saved by hope, but if we see it already, you know, why are we hoping for it? We don't see what this is, entails yet. We don't fully see, and if we seen, there would be no reason for us to hope for it because we would already have it. But the whole thing is that the reason we're saved by that hope is because we're to persevere and press, press upon trying to attain what that hope has got for us. This is what the Word of God clearly states for us. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we through what? With what? Patience. Wait for it. Now you know that this patience here is very similar to patience but the patience of the saints is a little bit different. And this is something that we want to begin to understand terminology as God expresses it to you and I in the word of God. This patience is the same patience found where in Romans? Five. Amen. Romans five. Let's go there. Romans five, three. All of these things work together. Start understanding how God is matriculating these things. So that we can have an understanding of it that we can share with other people. Look what he says here. Start at verse 3. And not only so, but, but we glory in tribulations. Also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience what? You see how this is a cycle. Tribulation worketh patience. Patience experience and experience worketh that hope. What do you mean? What do you think they mean? It worketh that worketh hope and experience and experience hope. From what vantage point does these things work together towards your hope? Well, everything that you will be, God has something in store for you already. But everything that you will be in the future over here in your glorification, guess when you really need to be trying to set, um, set it up? Right now. Everything that God has in store for us as far as what we are going to be as it pertains to heavenly places in the future, we are beginning to build those building blocks and establish what we are going to be based upon how we are interpreting and how we are uh, allowing Christ to utilize us in this earth today. This is something that we really want to try to begin to make a contrast with. Look in the same area of scripture, Romans 8. No, actually, I'll, I'll finish that. I'll finish Romans 5 here. It says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now turn over here to Romans 8. We're going to continue to look at this glorification, because Romans 8 really gives you some information on this. We want to take a look at this. And try to pull some, some encouragement out of it. Verse 18. <laughs> Romans 8 and 18. 
For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, what's the sufferings of this present time? Disease, uh, health, medical, just external things. Everything that's going on in your life, this is what the Word of God is letting you know, that whatever you're going through right now in your life, and this is why it's so important to have this hope, because God is letting you know. I, I often tell this little this story about the little girl who had to go to the dentist. She had to get her time. Uh, she had to get her tonsils out. I was told you about this story. She had to get her tonsils out, and uh, she was dreading that. That just she just couldn't see how she was ever going to live another day and have to have her tonsils put out. That just seemed to be so detrimental to her. So her mother, being somewhat clever, found out something that she liked a whole lot that could kind of coincide with her tonsils being out. She said, you know what? You're going to have to have your tonsils out. You're going to have to go through this suffering of getting your tonsils out. This, you, you got to do it. It's bad for you. It's going to cause some problems for you. We don't want you to have those problems. But guess what? After you get your tonsils out, we're going to take you to get all the ice cream you ever want to eat. You just I'm going to buy ice cream. You can just eat ice cream all day. You're just going to have some ice cream. And the girl was so excited about the ice cream is that she was looking forward to going through what she had to go through because she's seen the other side. Because the, the expectation of that ice cream was so greater than I, yeah, I was scared to go through the suffering of getting my tonsils out, but if that's what I got to do to get to that ice cream, let's bring it on. <laughs> bring it on, because I'm getting this ice cream. But that's got how, how God wants us to look about our glorification. Amen. God has something magnificent for us in store for our glorification, and we have to go through some things in order to really fully benefit and be who we, God wants us to be on this side. We're going to go through suffering. What the word of God tells us about? Those that will live godly in Christ Jesus will what? They're going to suffer persecution. It's not been a point. It's been a point to us not only to believe, but to do what? Suffer. Suffer. Suffer is coming. And guess what? How the body works. And this is why you want to understand how the body works. Because you and I are all one big lump. God sees us as one body. So look how suffering works. That means if I'm slacking off and not really doing much, but Steve is going out and he's witnessing and rightly divided and living his life in a way, that means his suffering is connected to me. You see that? Look at wrong. Um, 1 Corinthians. Now we talked about this before, but I want you to see it. Because it's a body, the suffering is a collective thing that the whole body has in store. Um, 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, look at verse 24, we're going to read down. For our comely parts have no need. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked that there be no schisms in the body, but the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member shall be honored, and all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members what? In particular, see, the, what, when God is looking at it as from a vantage point of suffering, he's talking about how we all will suffer based upon being united in one body. So let's look over here back at Romans 8. Romans 8. Now this really starts laying out who we are and what we shall be, and you want to, you want to understand it and grasp it now. Verse 16, the spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we what? Are we suffering with him? So, so. And the reason I'm going to say is because we talk about glorification. Are we suffering with him? Yes. You, got, you got to believe the body is suffering with them. When the body stops suffering with them, <coughs> there's going to be the end of this age. So it says, and, if the, and then if children, the heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with them, that we may be also what? 
glorified, glorified together. together. We're going to be glorified together. It's not going to be me being glorified, then Jack being left out. Jack being glorified, but Steve being left out. It's not a situation like that. All of us are going to be glorified together. It's a guarantee, and it's what God is going to do based on how he has the body structured. Verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. There's no comparison to what God is going to do with us and what we're going through right now, just like I was talking about the tonsils. There's no comparison. Well, you know, the ice cream is really a fickle type of a thing, but she loved the ice cream so much, but we don't even know what's in store. But God is telling you what I have in store for you is so much more greater than what you're going through. I, I just have to trust God that that is true. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. All of this is pointing at our glorification. All of these verses we talk about here is pointing at this area in the future that God is going to actually uh, manifest these things in our life. We're waiting the creature. We're the creature that's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. How was the creature made subject to vanity? By who? Adam. Adam made man. Do you realize that Adam made us subject to vanity? Adam put us in a position there. Nothing we could do would make would work before God. And without Jesus Christ, the last Adam, we wouldn't have had any hope. I hope this ain't going over anybody said here. But this is what it means, subject to vanity. Adam put us in a position where everything was in vain. We were without hope, without God in the world. We didn't have anything. But when Jesus Christ revealed what he did, now we have a hope because of what Christ did. So it really opened up a door here. Verse 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Right now we are in a state. Look at what it says about us. The creature itself should be delivered from the bondage of corruption. From what vantage point are we in the bondage of corruption? What? Just say that in plain words. Just want to make sure all of us know. We're still, see, this, we're still living in the flesh in the sin cursed body. We're still living in these bodies. That's all that's saying. It's saying a whole lot to make it say a very simple thing. We're still living in these bodies that are not fashioned to whom God is going to have us over here. That's corruption. Why is this corruption? Because guess what? When it dies, it corrupts and goes away. Corruption. That's what we're talking about. We're in the bondage of this corruption, but we're going to be um, uh, into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together. And not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, what? Waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of our body. Everything that that's stating is here. The redemption of our bodies. That's another term for what happens at glorification. We want to know the details about what is going to happen in the future with us. These are the things that are actually going to take place in the future with you and I. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. This is where our gospel is found, and it begins to lay out some glorious truth as it pertains to these things as well. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. We're going to start at verse 40. For time's sake, we're going to start at verse 41. First Corinthians 15, 41. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in what? See, this is something that we start making contrasts with. We have a hope that we're in corruption now, but what God is telling us in the future, you're going to be in incorruption. 
It's something totally different that God has in store for us. As simple as these things sound, we need to continue to refortify ourselves with the information because this is what we want to be able to share with other individuals. People are totally lost as it pertains to the hope that God has for individuals today. Am I going to heaven? Am I going to hell? Am I going to fly around like an angel? What's going on? Am I going to go to hell and be a worm? What's, what is the situation? And the Bible has a lot to say about a lot of those things, but you need to know what to tell them in order for them to be um, in the right standing with God. So these things about glorification will be true about them. <coughs> uh, verse uh, 43, it is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. That's to the right. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised high. In power. This is all the things. Recognize who you are now and your shortcomings and your limitations. See and know how God recognizes you while you're still in the physical body. These are the limitations of this physical body that we have right here. And God refers to that as dishonor. He refers to it as weakness. There's some things that you won't understand. There's some things that you won't be able to do because you're still in these bodies. But he's saying that he's contrasting this in your glorification. He says that you're sown in dishonor and you're raised in glory. You're sown in weakness and raised in power. What is the idea of being sown? Born. What is it? Born. Born, you said? Yeah, like a plant. Amen, that's it, like a plant. So what do you do? How do you sow a, what do you do to, with a plant? You plant it, amen. So you take that soil, you split that soil, and you sow it. You sow that seed down in the soil. And what he's saying that when you identify with Christ, you're sown in one thing, you're sown in dishonor, but he goes to share you what exactly the, 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 the outcome of that. You're sown in dishonor, and that's where we're buried with him. We're buried with Christ. That's why the significance of the burial, because all those things that happened with us in time past, God took on this dishonor. God took on this weakness through Jesus Christ. He took on this weakness. He was sown in those things, planted in the ground. You're talking about first fruits. These are the things which you talk about as it pertains to how we come up in this glorified manner. Look what it says here. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown. Look what it says here. It is sown a natural body and it is raised what? Are you a spiritual body right now? No. Spiritual body. No. no. That's something that we're hoping for. We're talking about our hope. And our hope tells you that you're going to one day have a spiritual body. You know why this is so important to me? So many people put so much stock in their physical body, in their natural body. People paying billions of dollars to try to keep this thing going and working good. And, and, and a lot of people trying to find out how they can live better. Or how they can live an extra 30, 40, 50 years. And, and, and I understand having life and having a good quality of life while you're here. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I definitely don't want to go. But you have to see what most of the motivation for that is. Is because they don't really line up with what God's answer for illness and stuff is. They'd rather preach or not rightly divide the word of truth and tell you about when you have sickness, God got healing for you. That happens right now. How many of you need any type of infirmity? Got any type? All the way, we heal all the way from cancer all the way to halitosis. <laughs> Whatever the problem is, God got the cure for you. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. See, and that's what the, this world is going to try to demonstrate to you or show to you out of God's word how God has a physical answer for you because they don't really understand about the hope that we have. The world wants to do it through science. And, and, that's, and, and they want to do it through science and thinking they understand the, the human body to an extent that they're going to do all these, spend all these millions of dollars again. That's where you go. All these millions of dollars on research to try to figure out how they can make the heart continue to but, see, that's the main thing. If they can get the heart to pump longer and keep beating longer, you'll live longer. That's how if we can get that heart. We can just control that heart. So they try to get all kind of antioxidants and what you can do to make sure your, 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 your valves in your heart and your veins and all that cleans out your heart so you don't have to have any type of uh, uh, what they call those things that go, go to your heart and rupture. Aneurysms and blood clots and different things like that. And they concentrate on your diet and different things like that. You know, which you you know, it's, there's some there's some truth in that. You know what I mean? 
But those physical things only profit little. They didn't read the verse that says we only got 120 years. <laughs> and that's been reduced drastically if that, you know what I mean? If you get past 70 plus, you know, 70, you really, 72, you're really in good shape. But three score 10. So we see that this is the answer that a lot of the world has. We go a little further here. Let's jump down to verse 46. How be it that was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. It's talking about the first Adam and the last Adam. The first man is of earth and uh, earthy, and the second as the man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And it's, as is it heavenly, such also that is in heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the what? That's what it's letting us know. Right now we're here. <clears throat> our image in this life is earthy. But our hope is to have a heavenly image. This is going to happen. And just because we don't talk about it, just because nobody has came back to say, look, and obviously they can't yet because it, you know, it hasn't manifested. But you have, sometimes because we can't see things, they, we, they kind of get off our mind and we lose sight that there is something glorious in, 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 in store for us because of our hope that God has presented for us in his word. And he goes on to say here, and as we have borne the image of the earth, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit what? In corruption. It doesn't inherit in corruption. Now, this is the verse 51. It really gets down into some dynamics and something that you have to really begin to embrace from the vantage point of God revealing to us something that had never before been revealed. In this area of scripture, because when people don't rightly divide the word of truth, they try to act like this is something that happened all the time. In fact, there's a passage of scripture in Matthew that they try to act like this is a part of what he's saying there. But this is something that the Apostle Paul reveals to us that is uniquely identifying with our situation. This is a hope that nobody else in time past over here in the scripture had any hope of, and it's not their hope. Nobody here in the future have this hope. It's only you and I in this time we call but now the area of scripture, Romans through Philemon, that has this hope. It's a part of this mystery that the Apostle Paul is preaching exclusively to you and I as members of the body of Christ. So if somebody else is preaching out of Matthew, Mark, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel, but they're telling them about this hope. Does that hope link up with what they're preaching out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No, it doesn't. What about they're preaching out of Hebrews and James? Talking about beat works, faith plus works. If they're preaching faith plus works, they don't have this hope that the Apostle Paul is about to reveal to you and I out of this book of Corinthians. Right here in Corinthians 15, verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. That's something that's absolutely unheard of. The word of God is revealing to us that God could come back right now and some of us might not be in the generation that we have to physically die in order to be with Christ. Something has happened that with a lot of the theologians, somebody made a reference to it earlier, talks about the rapture. They call it the rapture. But the Bible actually says that we shall be changed. You know what that change is being made, making a reference to here? Our glorification. So... The Bible doesn't always say glorification, but every instance that it comes up, you better know what it's talking about. It's talking about this aspect of your salvation where it is complete. Your salvation, your hope is being experienced. You're experiencing your hope. And that should motivate you to want to consider what you need to do to make sure you're the best you can be. And we're going to talk about that. We don't want to get there sad. You want to make sure you're the best you can be here. Look at verse 52. In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and what? We shall be changed. So now we have a we have an understanding of how this is gonna work. If it happened right now, all of those that preceded us in death, or the Bible refers to them as being sleep in Christ, all those that preceded us or went before us, if Christ came back right now, he's saying that we will be changed. 
Our bodies would be changed into this glorified state. They would be raised incorruptible into that glorified state, and we would be with the Lord. Look what it says here. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass. Now this is the importance of it. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory. This is where death is swallowed up in victory. How many of you want victory over death? Yeah. This is it. Your glorification is what assures you that you're going to have victory over death. If you, if you do go to sleep, you're going to have victory over death because when Christ comes back from you, he's going to raise you from the dead. If you're not dead, if you're not dead and you're still living, you're not going to have to experience the death because he's going to swallow death up in victory and just change you in the state that you're in. We're talking about the details and the dynamics. This ain't really that, that jumping up shout stuff, but it's just very, very sound doctrine about our hope that we shall experience in the future. And all these phrases that connect itself to our glorification, death being swallowed up in, in, in victory, redemption of our body, we just try being changed. Those are terms that are uniquely associated with glorification. With glorification. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But God be thanks to uh, uh, but but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look what it says here. Now this is why we know that this all goes together. It says, "Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding where in the, in the work of the Lord." Now this is saying because of what I'm sharing with you about glorification. He says, be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He's saying that he's using the revelation of our glorification to motivate you to continue in the work of the Lord. Why would he do that? Let you know it's, not in vain. it's not in vain. So what you're doing here has everything to do with this and there is a connection. What do you think about it? Your boss gives you a job. At the end of the week, he gives you some real blank, some real, you know, kind of information before you start. You're going to work for me for a month. I'm going to pay you at the end of the month. You know, if you work from 6 to 7, you'll get double time. If you work on off days, I'll give you triple time. If you work uh, off on your lunch breaks, I'm going to give you 10 times your pay. You know, he gives you dynamics that if you understand what he's saying, at the end of the month, your check can either be smaller or it can be greater. Now, based upon how everybody hears the instructions that the boss gives for that job that lasts one month, some people might say, well, I have a lot of other things to do, so I'm just going to work the regular 9 to 5 shift and I'm going to come in. But some people see it as a great opportunity. He's saying, man, he's saying if I work, did you hear what he said? He said if you work your break, your break hour, that lunch, that one hour lunch hour, if you work, he'll give you 10 times for that one hour. Every, I'm working every lunch hour. You see what I'm saying? So you, you start understanding the details of what the, what the benefit is going to be, and you start doing it. So you come in, you work overtime, you stay an extra hour, you work all of the, uh, the different uh, lunch breaks all throughout that whole month, and now your check is $10,000 person who just worked the regular nine to five check this fifteen hundred dollars they're gonna look back at you and like whoa that's a big I wish I would have you know everybody know I wish I would have worked that what that, how did you get ten thousand what are you gonna say he understood the details. yeah he, he told us to you that you know that lunch hour we used to go to lunch and smoke cigarettes and do all that and I stayed at work Really wasn't no harder job, but just by staying, you got ten times the pay if you just did that. Because he understood the details and he worked out the details of what the instructions was. What I'm trying to tell us today, Grace Family Bible Church, there's some things that we don't see in the future, but if we prepare for them properly, it's like putting up a bank account that you never can. It's far beyond a bank account. There's some things that you can have in glory that you just have to be steadfast and unmovable right now, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
And we're equipped to do it. Don't waste the opportunity. When we're talking about witnessing individuals, those things have eternal value. Your affection on things above, not on things above. Amen. Amen. All that goes together. For as much as you know that your labor is what? It's not in vain. Go over here to 1 Corinthians. 3. 1 Corinthians 3. It's a pep talk for us to realize that shoot. We 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 want we see we go we get so caught up in on, you know. Everybody say, if we in this life only have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men what? Most miserable. Most miserable. And a lot of people only really looking at Jesus Christ for what he can do for us in this life. They forget that there's something greater that we have for eternity. Let's prepare for eternity. Don't waste your time with vain glory and doing things that are, 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 are meaningless because at the end, only what you do for Christ will last. I guarantee you. And this is what we want to show here. Look what it says here. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, we're going to start at verse 11. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, Wood, hay, stubble, right? Yeah. He's giving us some information here. Look what it says here. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work. You remember that your, 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 your work... For the Lord, work of the Lord. Look what it says. This is a contrast. This is blending this all together is. Bringing it all together. Every man's work shall be manifested for the day shall declare it because it, it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What is your work? And what is your work based on? For time's sake, we need to... What do you think your work is? Your life. Your life. What you're doing in your life, right? Now, God is going to try your life, and he puts it in two different categories. He says either you're building with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, stone. How do you believe? You, you see the contrast between these two, and we've made a contrast between them. This list is a contrast of things that are incorruptible and what? Corruptible. Corruptible. What you're doing in your life is building on, based upon these two platforms. <coughs> Either you're building in your life things that are incorruptible or you're building things that are corruptible. How do I assure that the things that I send forth through my life are going to be incorruptible? Based upon what Paul wrote. Amen. Based upon what Paul wrote, basing on sound doctrine, based upon rightly dividing the word of truth. How many people are going to church every Sunday, but they're not building on incorruptible? They're building wood and stuff. Way too many. Way too many. Amen. That's a great response. If you are not doing things in the manner that God would have you to do them, and I always try to give an example, what do you mean by that? Well, that's, we always use this because people need to know this. This is a very beneficial one. What is our forgiveness based upon today? Now, we're going to show how this is contrast. Now, either I can work my forgiveness toward this world based upon being incorruptible, because all everything you do is being examined by God, or I can work my forgiveness of this world based upon being corruptible. Now, if I forgive you based upon the scriptures, and the scripture says that I should forgive you in order for God to forgive me, and that's my methodology of how I'm working, the work of the Lord is coming through me. If I'm forgiving you based upon that, when I set this before God, which is it going to be? 
wood, hay, and stubble, okay? Why is it wood, hay, and stubble? You're doing it. I'm doing it because I'm trying, but I'm attaching it to the word of God. I see that back in Matthew. It's not sound doctrine. It's not rightly divided. Amen. See, we have to understand this. This is how we're going to try to make sure that our lives are reflecting things that are incorruptible. That at the end, we want to build gold, silver, and precious stones. And it is precious stones. Right? Yeah. We want to build gold, silver, and precious stones. And we want to really be able to share with individuals, how do I do that? I see it over there. I see him making a reference to these things. But how do I know that I'm building? Well, we're looking at the details. As, as it pertains to each aspect of your life. Right now, we're talking about forgiveness. So now, we want to share not only with you, but those that may be listening. How can I build gold, silver, precious stones as it pertains to my forgiveness towards others? First of all, I have to get the right doctrine. Right. I have to rightly divide the word of truth, go in God's word, extract out of God's word how God said that I should forgive individuals in this earth today. And once I do that, I put that in my understanding and I respond to you based upon that. So where do I find the doctrine? Ephesians 4 and 32. Amen. Ephesians 4th chapter verse 32 is the rightly divided word of God as it pertains to how you should forgive others. I forgive others how? Even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. I'm forgiving others even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven me. Look at the difference. In time past, if you're trying to go by forgiveness found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're trying to forgive individuals so that God, Christ, God will forgive you. You don't understand how God is forgiven today because today in the dispensation of the grace of God, you have already been forgiven. You have forgiveness as a present possession. You never have to be reissued forgiveness. You are forgiven because you have been placed in Christ. In Christ, you have forgiveness. It's always who you are. It's a part of your position. It's what God has granted to you. Now, based upon you being always forgiven, God utilized that as the purpose and the motivation behind why you should forgive other individuals. You're forgiving others as God, for Christ's sake, Half past tense already forgiven you. If you're forgiving anybody any other reason other than why God says you should do it today, you're building wood, hay, and stubble. But if you're doing it based upon sound doctrine, you're building gold, silver, and precious stone. These things are incorruptible. And when we get to our glorification and God looks back on our sanctified life and see that we were doing things properly, God looks at that and we get a reward for it. Some people are going to be saved and they're not going to be forgiving people right. They're going to lose that reward. Some people will be saved and they have been forgiving people right. They're going to receive a reward. You see the difference? This is why I want to share this with you here. We never want to try to brag or boast about anything. But as it pertains to our glorification, there are individual acclimates that you and I can achieve based upon obeying the doctrine. We have to get this. If one suffer loss because he's not doing it right, one gets a reward because he does do it right, you're, you're going to have gold, silver, and precious stones in this area, and he's going to have wood, hay, and stubble. The thing about it, that all of it has to go through fire. Let's go a little further here. Verse 13, 1 Corinthians 3. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. You remember he was saying over here in Corinthians later on in, in passage 15 that you know that you know, that your labor not be in vain, your work for the Lord not be in vain. You don't want it to be in vain from a vantage point of not doing it in the manner that God should, you know, get glory out of it. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try what? Every man's work of what sort it is. So when this this goes through fire, and now we're just going to highlight this particular aspect. And, you know, we, we're taking a little liberty here, but it's, it's lining up. I can go scripturally. We're just talking about forgiveness here. There's a lot of different areas that we can go into, but we're just dealing with one so we can see how it works. Now, when this goes through the fire, if it's found upon right um, sound doctrine...
is going to be incorruptible. This person is going to receive a reward. Gold, silver, precious stones. And now this particular one here is wood, hay, and stubble. And this is going to be based upon erroneous doctrine or error. People using the um, doctor, word of God deceitfully. People trying to use the areas of scriptures that really do not apply to their situation. People going back here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and trying to extract things that don't apply to you and I as members of the body of Christ. Big difference. And you'll see that time and time again. You never want to try to match yourself up with what God is doing in time past and try to pull it off as doctrine. Verse 14. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall what? So you're talking about work abiding, receive reward. That's what we want our work to do. We want our work to abide so that it receives reward. If any man's work abide where he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now look, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. So one is abiding, and the contrast to abiding is be burned. And he's going to do what? Suffer loss. Suffer loss. So there's two different contrasts between the believer and the works that he put up before God. And the thing I want to share with you about this as it pertains to the body of Christ, you, say, you see that if he says, if any man, you know why you need to pay attention to that? You know what's different about this than you see in a lot of areas of scripture? It's wrote in the singular. You ever notice that? You know what it means when it's wrote in the singular? It applies to you and not anybody else. It, it applies. This is directly to you. You don't find often in the, in, the, in, the, in the doctrine that it's talking about you exclusively. He often says ye or we collectively. But here he's saying this is you. I want you to know that you ain't going to have no excuse for why you didn't receive reward because you weren't obeying or using sound doctrine. Because everything that you do in your body and everything that you do as a person to rightly divide the word of truth is going to be based upon what kind of reward you have in glory. Are we getting the information so that we are equipped to get the reward that God has for us in glory? And this is not anything to brag about. We're not positioning ourselves that we're bragging or boasting about what God is doing. We're saying this so that we'll understand that there is something unique about the way we manifest ourselves so that God rewards us for this. He's very clear with telling us what he is doing here. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself, what? Shall be saved, yet so as by fire. This is that good thing about understanding at glorification. There's a process by which, when we're glorified, that our works are going to go before God. And in a sense, he's telling us that those works are going to go through fire. And everything that we do in our sanctification is going to be tested before God, whether or not it was based upon sound doctrine, which gives you a reward of gold, silver, and precious stones, or is it going to be wood, hay, or stubble? Where are we going to be at? And I showed and shared with you that how that is an individual thing. That's not anything that's collective. Let me share you the contrast of why I say that. You need to know the difference between when he's saying something collectively versus. Um, God bless you. Romans eight seventeen. Then I'm gonna go over Colossians. We had talked about this earlier, in fact. I just want to share this with you, how, it's, how, it, how it includes everybody here versus being, if any man, talking about specifically. <clears throat> and, and if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that ye, we may be also glorified together. I want you to see something here. Is he saying if any man? No. He's saying we. And the reason he's talking saying we is because we is corporate. 
That means it's everybody. He's talking about the body. He's not talking about from an individual stand vantage point. And a lot of people, they, they try to interpret that as he's talking to, from an individual's vantage point, but he's actually talking about you and I collectively because every, is anybody in the body of Christ going to miss glorification? No. Absolutely not. And he's talking about the collective body. It's not like you do something wrong and you miss glorification. When he's talking about you individually, he's talking about your reward. But all of us are going to suffer because if one man suffer, we all suffer. So all of us will be glorified together. Turn to Colossians. Just bring out the significance of why I want to just share that. How you're uniquely... Because this verse can be somewhat... Confusing to individuals too. Over here in Colossians 1. Look what it says here. I want you to be able to explain this. Colossians 1. In the body of his flesh, to verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Look what it says. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Why am I talking about this? Because it's talking about the hope of the gospel. Go a little further here. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, which was preached unto every creature which is under heaven. Wherefore I, Paul, have made a minister. Um, made a minister. Look what it says here. If ye continue to be grounded in the faith and settled. What does that sound like? So if you don't understand the difference between collectively and corporate conversation when he's making a reference to it in a singular conversation, you would have to be somewhat concerned right here. If you continue. Is it saying if you continue? No. What would be the difference between him saying if you continue versus him saying if ye continue? Singular. Individually and collectively. Amen. Well, what we want, we want to have to clearly see this. He's making a reference. You were singular. You is singular, but ye is collective. Ye is collective. It's plural. It's, it's bringing more into it, right? See, the idea is that we. This is a this is a um, a text that is written to the body. This particular verse is talking about the whole group of us collectively. How he wants to present all of us, present you holy and unblameable and reprovable in his sight. If ye collectively continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Is there going to come a time that we're going to be moved away from the hope of the gospel? Yes. Could be. Could be. Do you have any scriptures? Is there going to be a time in history, according to the yes. scriptures, that the, the body of Christ will be moved away from the hope of yes. the gospel? No. Romans 11, 2 Timothy 3. There you go. What is it? You see what we're saying? Amen. We're going to be at the end. That's how this end of this age is going to come. The, but there's going to be individuals in the body of Christ that are going to be saved. And this is what we're trying to save off today. That's why it's a blessing to see the, the your youngsters in here. It may, they don't really right now. They, you know, they still young and they still want to kind of like, you know, they have some youthful ambitions and different things like that. But the fact that we're planting this doctrine and when they get out into that world, They'll be able to have something to reflect on and they can possibly continue to age because what's going to happen, people are going to be saved by this gospel, but because they don't go forth with it, they're not going to be expressing that hope to other individuals. What if you're saved but you never tell anybody about it? And, you know, and your life is not reflecting it in any way. That really is, doesn't make a difference. But you're saved and what if everybody in here saved but never tell anybody about the gospel? They won't be able to commit it to faithful man who will be able to teach others also. And what's going to happen to that? That church is just going to have to dwindle away mm -hmm. because it's not perpetuating itself. It's not being, no, you know, we're not committing it to faithful men that's going to go to the next generation and the next generation. So when you talk about being moved away from this hope, you're talking about individuals stop preaching the gospel. Stop caring enough. Stop coming. You know what I mean? So this is what's going to happen at this age, in this particular age. And that's what this contrast here is when you talk about the difference between ye, if ye continue, it's talking about us collectively versus in our reward. Not glorification. This is guaranteed. But our reward is what God is instructing us individually on. That's why the terminology changes there. Turn to Titus. We're going to end here.
Titus 2. Titus 2. Verse 11 and 13. Very familiar text here. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You see right there the inner workings of what we've laid out right here. You'll see how God lays out justification, sanctification, and glorification in those three verses. For the grace of God that, of, um, that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. We talked about a couple of weeks ago how the grace of God that bringeth salvation is unto all. That I means it's unto all. God has enough righteousness for all mankind. It's unto all. We talk about how it's an unlimited provision. God has an unlimited provision of righteousness for everybody today. But it's only upon all of them that do what? Believe. Believe. There's a deciding factor in it. That's how an individual is justified. So when he's talking about appear to all men, that's the contrast there. Then it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What is that making a reference to? Sanctification. Sanctification. This is what should manifest itself because this is what is sanctification is the grace of God that is teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and instructing us, just like McNeek had said, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then last but not least, our glorification. Look what it says. This is what the, the motivation is. We're always looking. This is where we want our mindset to leave here today based upon this study of glorification. This is what the word of God says we should be doing. We should be looking for that blessed hope. This is our blessed hope. And we should be looking for that That's what we should be doing here. Looking for that blessed hope. Look what it says. And the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's glorification. And our mindset towards that any day, we're looking for it. We're supposed to love his appearing. We're looking for that. That's where our mindset is supposed to be at. Don't allow the things of this world to cloud your vision and your mindset between what you're looking for in this world. Because when you start looking at the events of this world, it's meant to, to oppress you and suppress you and to bring you into the, the, the happenings of this world. And then you start being politician. You want to be politically correct and have your spew and your say on every matter that comes in life because you're not focused on the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. You think that you're, God sent you down here to straighten out all the politicians, to straighten out all the world issues. That's not what God sent us to do. We're not to be the ones trying to say we live godly in this world and, 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 and promote godliness in our character and the things that come from us. But we're not to try to get into politics to think that politics are going to be the things that bring about change that God wants because it's not going to bring about the change. It gives us a level of peace, but it's not God is doing that. It's not it, it, we're not the ones that are trying, trying to instrument um, instrument that. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. This should be our mindset, and we should keep this on as it pertains to trying to encourage one another about the hope that we have. Any comments or questions?